Roll out the red carpet and get your acceptance speech ready because we have your backstage pass to Hollywood. Backstage pass starts now. In five, four, three, two, are you ready? Thanks, Boris. Welcome back to Backstage Pass, where we give you the scoop on all things entertainment. My name is Kayla McRae. And my name is Lucas Alvin. But you already knew that. What I'm wondering is where Patrick went. Patrick's out today. He's actually going to see SZA. He'll tell us about it in another episode, but don't worry. You'll catch him later in an episode, in this episode, in a fast and fun segment. Before we get this episode started, we have some sad news to get out of the way. Daytime Emmy winner, Billy Miller, best known for his roles on soap operas such as General Hospital, All My Children, and The Young and the Restless, has passed away from battling bipolar disorder. In response, his family said, quote, he did everything he could to control his disease. He loved his family, his friends, and his fans. But in the end, the disease won the fight, and he surrendered his life, end quote. We at Backstage Pass would like to send our thoughts and prayers out to Miller's family. May he rest in peace. Last episode, we were talking about the SAG after and WGA Hollywood strikes. Well, we've got some more news for you on that. As of right now, the WGA have reached a temporary agreement with Hollywood executives. They're steering towards the direction of a permanent deal, but that's not quite the case with SAG after. An agreement for them still has yet to be made, and while they and while they wait for that, their strike is still on. In other news, the animated adaptation of the popular video game franchise, Castlevania, is receiving a new series titled Castlevania Nocturne. The story continues with the original protagonist Trevor Belmont's descendant, Richter Belmont, who attempts to prevent a new vampire ruler from taking over during the French Revolution. I am beyond excited for this show, as it is based off of Castlevania Rondo of Blood and my favorite video game ever, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. But even if you're not familiar with the games, I still highly recommend giving it a watch when it premieres on Netflix September 28th. Remember Bottoms from last episode? Well, guess what? It's on digital right now. If you didn't get a chance to see Bottoms in theaters, now's your chance. The absurdist comedy is now available to rent on Prime Video. A little surprising how quickly it went to streaming, but nonetheless, I'm excited for it to reach an even wider audience. Speaking of wide audiences, Fans of the Hunger Games series can look forward to the film adaptation of the prequel titled The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. The story is set during the time of the 10th annual Hunger Games with a young Snow, played by Tom Blythe, determined to regain his family's social status, but is faced with the issue of falling in love for mentor Lucy Gray, played by Rachel Zegler. Will Snow gain power? Will Lucy survive the games? We'll have to wait and see when the film hits theaters November 17th. Or you could just read the book. It's up to you. If you were a fan of the Percy Jackson books, then we've got good news for you. A Percy Jackson show is coming to Disney Plus in late December. Its title, Percy Jackson and the Olympians. A teaser trailer was released on September 10th, and just like the books, it'll follow 12-year-old modern demigod Percy Jackson and his two friends, Grover and Annabeth, to restore Olympus of Zeus's mass, master lightning bolt. The exact release date for the show is December 23rd. All right, Lucas, so what is your opinion on both of these things, like Hunger Games and Percy Jackson? It's been a while since I've watched them, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, really excited for uh, Percy Jackson. Uh, how long has it been since the last movie came out? I don't even know. I'm not even familiar with the <laughs> franchise. Like, I didn't read the books, unfortunately. I never saw the movies, but I know people who are, like, huge Percy Jackson fans. 
Yeah, I'm the same way with Hunger Games. Yeah. Like, I've watched the movies when I was younger and when they kind of came out, but it's been so long now, my mind's all fuzzy, and I'm like, wait, what were they about? Yeah. Even writing that script, <laughs> I was like, these characters sound familiar. Yeah, like, they, they're very familiar, like Katniss Everdeen, Jennifer yeah. Lawrence, but, like, I still am also pretty, like, unfamiliar with the Hunger Games franchise, but yeah. maybe, maybe this will make me, like, read the books more. I think I just need to read more, like, in general, to be honest. Yeah, but. I'm the same way. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask, Bottoms going to digital. I was kind of 50-50 with the movie. Should I check it out? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really liked it. Um, I mean, I rated it, like, maybe, like, four out of five stars, but it's still, like, really good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, would you say it's more on the corny side, or it has some serious elements that could appeal to kind of my style and tastes? I would say it's... It's corny, but it's on purpose. Like, okay. it's it knows what it's doing, and I think there's like a serious element to it. But it weaves very well with like its absurdity, and I really like movies like that at this point. So awesome. Yeah. And Castlevania, have you ever seen anything with that? I I know I knew there was a Netflix show out of it since like 2017. Um, that was a really long time ago. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, I didn't I actually didn't know it was like a video game until recently. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You should totally crazy. check it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough about our movie and TV news. Now Daniel Samuels is gonna talk to us about Hispanic Heritage Month and some of his favorite Hispanic movies. Take it away, Daniel. Hola amigos y amigas. Dingo, aka Danny J. Samuels here. It feels great to be back. As some of you may know, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. You may be celebrating with music, yummy food, but it's also a fun time for movies that dive into Hispanic culture. Today, I got four in my mind that you might enjoy. These are the Mingos, Amos, which is Spanish for let's go. First up is Encanto. Disney has made some enjoyable movies over the years, and Encanto is no exception. The movie is about a Colombian family called the Ma Madrigals, who have, to, who have to leave their home and hunt down a new place. That ends up being in Kondo, a town full of magic bordered by many mountains. The family do receive special gifts and blessings, but disappear one by one. This movie teaches us about owning up to one's ex expectations, especially when it comes to preserving magic and love for the family. We may not talk about Bruno, but many will talk about the movie for years to come. Second movie, Coco. This movie puts in a lot of work to emphasize the Mexican holiday, the Day of the Dead. In this movie, a 12-year-old named Miguel is sent from a town where music is banned to what resembles the world of the dead people. Going there also puts a curse on Miguel that jeopardizes not only his guitar, but his whole life. Miguel has to bring a blessing home to save his life and love for music. This is one movie a lot of people recommend watching, whether or not it is the Day of the Dead. Third on the list is the Cheetah Girls. And I know what you're thinking. The first one? No, not the first one, but the second one. Compared to the first one, this movie has a lot of Spanish culture because a good chunk of the movie takes place in Barcelona. In addition, one of the main stars, Adrian Eliza Bailon, he and was born and raised in a Hispanic family. Two of the songs, as being Strudge and Amigas Cheetahs, also add some Latin pop to the groove. This movie was the most watched on the Disney Channel before Jumpin' and High School Musical came along. Go jam along to this mo movie, you'll love it. And my fourth movie is In the Heights. Based on the musical of the same name, this movie tells young kids a story about Washington Heights, a Dominican neighborhood in Manhattan, New York. One of the female characters in the movie returns home because racial prejudices forced her to drop out. The movie has a lot of Dominican culture and Hispanic music to grow to. There's also a winning ticket worth $96,000 mixed in. Go check out the movie to see what the townsfolk will do with all that money. I know what I do. Oh, I won 
there you have it. Four movies I think you should watch as Hispanic Heritage Month is here. There are plenty more, more worth checking out, but I can't go over all of them. I'll take up the whole show. From everyone at Backstage Pass, have a happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Now back to you, amigos, in the studio. Thanks, Daniel. I'll be adding some movies to my list after that. On the topic of multicultural performers, on September 14th, legendary musician Yoshiki became the first Japanese artist to receive the honor of having his handprints and footprints immortalized at the TCL Chinese Theater in Hollywood. In attendance at the event was Gene Simmons from the band KISS and Yi Byung from the show Squid Game, who both gave great speeches on Yoshiki's talent and how his music has touched audiences all around the world for the past 30 years. Wow, congrats to Yoshiki. In other music news, Olivia Rodrigo has just announced that she's going on tour. That's right, tickets are on sale now for her Guts World Tour. She'll be visiting places like Birmingham, London, Paris, Amsterdam, and the good old US of A. She'll even be making a stop right here in Philly on July 19th at the Wells Fargo Center. The Guts World Tour includes opening acts such as Remy Wolf, Pink Panthers, Chapel Roan, and 90s alt rock band The Breeders. All such amazing artists. This lineup is a total dream for me and millions of other fans. Ticket competition and prices are high. We might just have another Eras tour from now on on our hands. Oh, did you think I was done talking about Yoshiki? That was me just warming up before. Yoshiki just wrapped up his international tour for the premiere of his directorial debut titled Yoshiki Under the Sky. The film is a music documentary about the period during the pandemic when artists were unsure how to connect with their fans. It also is filled with a star-studded lineup of live performances featuring artists like The Chainsmokers, Scorpions, and Hyde, and many more. Oh yeah, and the Japanese premiere of the film had a special guest appearance by Godzilla, who looked quite handsome if I do say so myself. Now that's a place I would least expect to see a guest star appearance from Godzilla. On the other hand, I've got another new album release, Mitski's The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We album. This includes singles like Bug Like an Angel and Star Be With Heaven. One of the most popular tracks, according to Spotify, is My Love, All Mine. It's currently at the second most popular Mitski song on the platform. I gave it a listen, and its hypnotizing somberness is certainly touching, and I totally understand why it's so popular. I'll have to give the whole album a listen sometime. Okay, can you guess what I'm going to talk about next? That's right, it's Yoshiki and all the music he's released lately. Yoshiki's band and my all-time favorite band, X Japan, released their first single in eight years titled Angel. The song is a great example of how the band has evolved their sound over the years, but is still able to seamlessly blend genres together, like mixing classical piano with heavy metal. If that's not flashy enough, Yoshiki's other band, The Last Rock Stars, have you covered. The band consists of four of the biggest names that Japanese rock has to offer, who formed late last year with their targets set on the global music market. Recently, the band's second single, titled Psycho Love, released, and the, and the electric rock tune has been stuck in my head ever since. It's a lot of Yoshiki news, Lucas. Patrick's also got some music news of his own to report. He'll take it from here. Hello everyone, my name is Patrick O'Hara, your third host for this season's Backstage Pass. Over the past few weeks, there have been so many new music releases. In fact, there have been so many, we weren't sure if we'd be able to cover them individually. So, I thought it'd be fun to give you all a fast and fun rundown of all the hottest new music. So get out your headphones and get ready to listen. Firstly, Olivia Rodrigo released her brand new sophomore album titled Guts, containing 12 tracks. The album overall is a mix between bedroom pop and grunge pop rock, and yeah, she really spilled her guts with this one. Next up, we have Doja Cat with her brand new album titled Scarlet. Initially, the album was set to release with only 15 songs, but Doja added two more tracks to the album at the last minute. The album really deserves all the attention. SZA and Drake also teamed up for a new song titled Slime You Out. Honestly, they both went off on the song. Yet, they're not the only ones who went off on a song, though. Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion returned for another collaboration together after a while. This new collaboration is titled Bongos, and it even received a music video with its release as well. With Pink Friday 2 coming out in October, Nicki Minaj released a taste of what that album is going to look like with her new song titled Last Time I Saw You. 
If you love old Nikki, you'll love this track for sure. Madison Beer also released her new album, Silence Between Songs, consisting of 14 tracks. To be honest, she really showed us how to make a good album. After just releasing new music earlier in the year, Kim Petras returned with yet another album titled Problematique. The album itself was shelved by her record label after being leaked online in 2022, until Petra's surprise dropped the album for her fans and new listeners alike. Addison Ray is another artist that also dropped an EP consisting of four tracks that previously leaked online in 2022 as well. The EP was titled AR and even contained a song featuring Charlie XCX. Considering rock is totally in these days, Demi Lovato revisited 10 of her older songs and reworked them to a rock sound with an album title revamped. Sorry not sorry, but she did that. And to conclude, Ariana Grande released a 10 year anniversary edition of her debut album, Yours Truly. This edition contains brand new live recordings of six songs off the album. Her vocal growth is truly magical. Well, I believe that just about covers it all. Like I said, there have been just so many music releases as of late, we didn't know where to start. I hope you enjoyed this fast and fun rundown of the hottest new music. We're excited to talk more new music with you as the show goes on. So without further ado, let's head back to the studio with Lucas and Kayla. Thanks, Patrick. All right, so yeah. I know that was a lot of music news, but and I know you went on like this huge spiel yeah. about Yoshiki, but yeah. I kind of want to know more. <laughs> more than that? Yes. <laughs> Where should we start? I don't even know. Look, you. So have you ever heard of him prior to this? Or no. Like, really? Yeah. No, I was a bit surprised. Like, his name I know, but I'm all into international music. Like, yeah. But I was kind of surprised, like, yeah, to get a thing at TCL Theater is like, that's a huge landmark right there. And I think that has only like 300 people that have ever gone in. Um, and the like famous Hollywood uh, stars on the Walk of Fame yeah. like quadrupled the number. So it's insane that like, yeah, he's good enough to reach that level. Yeah, and he's an international artist. That was a pretty like yeah. awesome achievement on his part. Yeah. And w yeah, what did you think about the whole part about like uh, him and other Japanese artists finally trying to break into the Western market? I feel like it's really interesting. Like even when you think about like K-pop bands and things like that, I think like a lot of them, I guess, tap into like a Western market, I guess, to like expand their like fan base mm -hmm. and like have like a better opportunity to like grow their platform. Yeah. So that's always like a really cool thing when they can reach like more people than like mm -hmm. just like their home country. It's, it's yeah. cool for anyone, really. No, it's also really cool because I mentioned in there that like obviously to get a compliment from Gene Simmons from like Kiss, one of the most successful commercial bands, like that's awesome. Yeah. But uh, Yi Bu Young from Squid Game even said like back in the '90s, uh, his band X Japan was like so influential in Korea that um, like it was a crazy honor when those two met. So like. And that was like the 90s, and he yeah. was, he, his music was expanding out of Japan. So I'm like, it's insane that, yeah, it hasn't hit America quite yet. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. I feel like the only, like, I, I feel like I wouldn't even be surprised if I had known or have heard his music mm -hmm. and I just didn't realize it was him. That happens to me yeah. so often. <laughs> no, I think he also did the, one of the award ceremony theme songs. I think it's the Grammys. No way. Like that really famous tune, but like no one knows it. <laughs> no way. Yeah, it's just like you look on his IMDb and all that stuff, and he's like done all these like really crazy, well-known songs, but like just no one knows him. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna look them up now because like I'm, I'm very curious now. Yeah, you totally should. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's jump straight into some drama. Kim Kardashian recently received some mixed reviews on social media after her acting performance as Siobhan Corbin in the new season of American Horror Story. One side is giving some harsh criticism, like one account on X saying, quote, Kim sucks at acting. Why is she on this? Ruined it for me. End quote. Then on the other side, you have fans giving Kim's acting high praise. I personally haven't had the chance to watch any clips of Kim's acting yet uh, to determine if it's good or bad. But whenever you see a, a, a Kardashian in the news, you can only figure that drama will follow. Hollywood icon Drew Barrymore is under fire for trying to restart production for her CBS talk show while the writer strike is still happening. But get this, she's a sag after board member. She claims to be in compliance with sag after and WGA rules with this show coming back. 
but she's still under fire from her fellow Hollywood peers and social media alike. She released an apology video on the matter, but then deleted it. This news is totally messy. As we mentioned in our last episode, this season marks the 25th anniversary of Backstage Pass. So in honor of this milestone, I invited all of the show's former hosts and producers to return for a special alumni segment. Our first returning host is Brenna Davini. So take it away, Brenna. Happy 25th birthday, Backstage Pass. I'm sorry, but you're now officially too old to date Leonardo DiCaprio. But that's okay, as am I. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Brenna Devaney and I graduated in 2015. Some of my favorite times at LaSalle happened while working as a host and producer on this show. My co-producers, Melissa, Kelsey, and I really just had so much fun putting these episodes together every single week. Being a part of LaSalle TV was probably one of the best decisions I made in college. One of my favorite memories was dressing up as Christmas elves for our annual holiday episode. Pretty sure to this day, I still have that costume <laughs> hanging up in my closet. There was also the time I got so hyped up on coffee and soda that I decided to push Melissa around the studio in a shopping cart because it's not like we had a show to put on or anything. Though we did do some work covering the top entertainment stories in our show this bites segment, including Kim and Kanye's wedding, the conscious uncoupling of Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin. All these years later, I really do not know what they even meant by that. And of course, the darkest period of my life. The Jonas Brothers breakup. But thank God that was all just temporary and I'm back to, of course, hunting down their tour bus at concerts. So all is right with the world. To all of the hosts, producers, and crew of this show, my best advice to you is to just have fun and to really embrace this as a learning opportunity. You know, so many of the writing and editing skills I use in my career today, I honed while producing Backstage Pass. It's, in my opinion, the best show on LaSalle TV, but I'm obviously very biased. So I wish you all of the very best of luck this season. Here's to the next 25 years, and to hopefully all of us getting out of that era's tour to get Master Q. Bye. Thank you for the great advice. We'll be sure to have fun and make the best of this awesome learning opportunity. And fun fact, that very shopping cart is still in the studio. So that picture may just need a reenactment soon. It's always great to hear from our alumni, but you know what else is great to hear from? Nintendo Direct. Let's talk the most recent video game announcements from them. The new title, or the title of the new game based around Princess Peach has officially been announced as Princess Peach Showtime. I was already interested in this game when it was announced in the summer, but after watching the video of the gameplay, uh, it looked amazing, and the costume designs especially. I think this game is now 100% uh, I'm getting it, which is actually quite unfortunate because I will have to wait until March 22nd of next year to play it. Mario fans are also in luck with the release of a Paper Mario game remake. The game in question is 2004's Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. From what I saw from the Nintendo Direct, it looks like such a good game. I'm not too experienced with the line of Paper Mario games, but I totally wouldn't mind giving this updated version a try. I do own a Switch after all. Another good-looking game presented in the Direct was Unicorn Overlord. Now, you're likely going, Lucas, what does, that even, what does that name even mean? And to answer that question honestly, I have no idea what Unicorn Overlord means. What I do know about the game is that it is a tactical RPG with some smooth-looking animation and some interesting-looking gameplay that I'm, excited, that I'm excited to learn more about when the game releases March 8th of next year. Okay, so this Nintendo Direct. You, you were talking about Mario. Um, are you going to get it when it comes out? Or? I don't know. Um, like I said, it seems like a really good game. Mm -hmm. And um, I do own a Switch, of course. <laughs> and I think I do need to expand my horizons when it comes to video <laughs> games because I'm so set on playing like Splatoon all the time. <laughs> Splatoon is my childhood game, but I kind of want to expand yeah. my horizons and like, play some more games. But um, also, uh, the Princess Peach game. Incredible. Yeah, that looks like Can't wait. awesome. It's crazy because um, Princess Peach, she's always like the like secondary character in a yeah. lot of the Mario games, which isn't bad. But, you know, this is like a change of pace yeah. almost. I think I read somewhere that like this is Peach's like first game in like 10 years. 10, 15 years, which is insane. Wow. Like, Wait, what was her, do you know what her last game was? I think it was a game on the DS. Um, oh but gosh. it was one of those like, 
it wasn't promoted very well. Yeah, which only figure. Which is insane because like she's still a main franchise character. Yeah, I've never even heard. I thought this was like the first Peach game, solo Peach game, like ever. Yeah, um, I'm really hoping that this game is really successful and can kind of branch off and hopefully create more games for her down the line. Yeah, I think between the two, although I would play both, I'm leaning more towards Peach. No, I'm the same in that regard. Like, yeah. Not to say that Paper Mario looks bad, and I know that got a ton of hype online, but there's something about Peach that, like, the game just looks great. Yeah. Um, did you see also the costumes in the game? Yes, yes. Like, I think it's called, like, Sword Fighter Peach. That looks so, like, I never thought I would see Peach in those outfits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the gameplay as well. Like, I think, again, going with the Sword Fighter Peach, um, it had her, like, cutting down branches and slicing enemies. And I'm like, this is so off-brand. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, exactly. And I love playing as Peach in Super Smash Bros. and Super Mario 3D World. Yeah. So I think, like, my love for playing as Peach, it'll easily translate <laughs> into, like, playing this game. Definitely. Yeah. Also, absolutely. what's up with all these new Mario games lately? I don't know. Like, we had these two games, and isn't there also Mario Wonder coming out pretty soon? I think so. And I know, I'm not sure what Mario game it is, but yeah, there are a lot of Mario games yeah, coming up. Just like five recently announced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, it's the end of today's show. Gosh. I wonder what our viewers thought about our stories, thoughts, and opinions of all the content we covered. I wish there's a place they could connect with us. Luckily, you can through our social media. Get your phone out and follow us on these various platforms seen on your screen. Give us a follow, leave a comment, and let us know if you have any suggestions. Have a great semester from all of us on Backstage Pass. I'm Kayla McRae. And I'm Lucas Alvin. We'll see you next time on Backstage Pass.